Norman Clark. Thank you so very much for coming out to our nature talks, our first nature talks for fall 2023. And this evening we have with us Lydia Wong. So Lydia is a PhD candidate at the University of Ottawa. And um, she's going to be talking about, as we see on the screen, what it means to be a bee in a hot, dry world. Um, so basically we will be looking at her research on the effects of climate change on wild bees. Oh. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Alicia. Um, dancing. Okay. So Alicia's introduced me already. What's that? Volumes. Yeah. Okay. Alicia's introduced me already, but I always introduce myself in, a, in my cartoonish way. So I'm Lydia. I am a PhD candidate at Ottawa U. I'm supervised by Dr. Jessica Forrest. And she does all kinds of interesting things with this tab. But my research specifically looks at the effects of climate change on wild pollinators, mostly bees, which I'm going to focus on today, but I'm also interested in wasps, and um, I hope that we can also um, be as enchanted with wasps as we can bees, but maybe that's for another time. Um, before I jump into telling you um, about what I'm going to talk about, to, or the, the main subject of today, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about where we're going to go with this talk. Um, I'm actually going to start by talking very generally about bees in general, because I think the media is very good at highlighting the wrong things about bees. And so hopefully we can get that sorted out before we actually talk about my research. Then I'll give you a bit of background on what we know about how insects respond to temperature, just very generally, because how bees respond to climate change might be very similar to how other insects respond to temperature. And then we'll get into some of the research that we've been doing, looking at the potential impacts of climate change on bees. Um, specifically, what's going to happen as things get hotter and drier. And I'll kind of talk about the, the general approach that I take to studying um, this subject. And I'll talk about some of the work we've been doing up in the Colorado Rocky Mountains, and also in urban areas, specifically Ottawa and Toronto. Okay, so you have a sense of where we're all going to go tonight, so we'll start by talking about who the bees are. So often when I go into classrooms and I talk to kids, I ask them this question, I say, what do you think of when you hear the word bee? And they give me all kinds of fun answers, but bees are the most common answers. So honey, stingers, big bug, black and yellow, queen, hive, busy. And I'm not surprised because this is what the media likes to highlight when it comes to bees. Well, usually we could do this exercise, and then I do a whole bunch of myth busting. I tell them that most of these things have nothing to do with most bees. And so I go through each of these because of the 4,000 bee species we have with us in North America, a single species makes honey, and that's the European honeybee. And as their name suggests, they're not native, so they, we introduced them from Europe in the 1600s. And they're also domesticated, just the way chickens and cows and ducks are. If you think about them, we have beekeepers who are making sure they're fed and keeping them uh, healthy if they get sick. So that's a lot like our livestock animals. And so in North America, um, at least I think we should try to move away from thinking of them as, as wildlife and try to think of them as more like livestock. And that's totally different from the other 4,000 bee species we have um, around us. These native wild bees, they aren't just black and yellow, they come in all colors, there are red ones and blue ones and green ones. Um, and actually a lot of them are just black or gray. So they're not just black or yellow. They're not just big bugs, they come in all different sizes. Um, here in Toronto, I don't get them in Ottawa, but we get these ginormous carpenter bees and they're very gentle. They're like the size of a toonie, so they're big, but they can also be very tiny. They're these yellow masked bees that are just a couple of millimeters long. So bees can be very small. Most bees don't live in colonies with queens or workers. Most of them are solitary. So it's just one female constructing her own nest, taking care of her own eggs all by herself. And most bees don't live in hives. They actually live all over the place with most of them living underground in the soil and then the other 25% of them living in all kinds of structures. So that could be dead plant stems, it could be 
pre-existing cavities in dead wood. There's even a species, admittedly not in North America, um, but the females will seek out abandoned snail shells to nest in. So all kinds of places and not hives. And I will say some bees are quite busy, like females who fly back and forth, collecting pollen and nectar and building their nests. That seems pretty busy to me, but not all bees are busy. And specifically, I'm thinking of male bees because they don't help with building the nest and their job is pretty much to mate, to drink nectar and to sleep with flowers and not do much of anything else. So they don't seem that busy to me at least. And then on top of that, there are a group of bees that have evolved to steal the nests of other bees. So females of these bees, they're called kleptoparasitic species, um, will seek out the nests of other females who have worked really hard to build their nests. And then they'll sneak in, lay their own egg on that nest. Um, and they don't have to do any of the work of collecting the pollen. So they don't seem that busy to me either. And finally, for the most part, I would say most bees are actually really gentle and they don't want to bother us. And partly that's because most species are solitary. So that means that the female goes all by herself. She doesn't have a whole bunch of backup to help her if she gets into trouble. And she also only has is protecting a few eggs, which um, maybe it's not worth it for her to get into a fight with a big animal. Whereas if you think about bees that are aggressive, like honeybees, they're protecting a huge hive of eggs and probably a lot of predators don't want to eat those eggs. So for them, they might want to be a bit aggressive. But again, honeybees are not like most of the bees we have. Solitary bees probably don't want to bother us. So there's that reason why they, I think they're gentle, but also male bees don't have stingers. And so that's a lot of bees out there couldn't even sting us, even if it made them very, very angry. And that's because the stinger is evolved from an organ called the ovipositor that bees use to lay eggs. And male bees don't lay eggs, so they don't have stingers. Um, I will say the bee that I'm having a conversation with here is a female bumblebee. And they do live in colonies. They do have stingers, but I think she doesn't feel very threatened by bees. So she was not in a stinging <laughs> mode that day. So when I think of bees, I'm thinking of these wild, native, gentle, solitary bees that are all different colors and sizes, that live all over the place, um, and that aren't necessarily always busy. And I will say, I think I'm interested in the honeybee because it's a very interesting species from a biological perspective, but hopefully we can move away from thinking about them as part of wildlife, because they are more like a farm animal. Okay, so I could really spend the entire evening telling you all about all the different kinds of bees that we have around us because I think they're just so interesting and they all do different things. Um, just very quickly, this is the Virginia carpenter bee I was telling you about. So they're probably the biggest species we have here. You can see her long top going down deep into that flower. Um, the bee up there, the stripy yellow and black one, it is yellow and black. It's a non-native species, but they are wool carter bees. So the females will actually gather the hairs from hairy plants like lamb's ears and line their nests with them. And the one with the big jaws, that's a leaf cutter bee that I'll talk more about. And the green one down there is actually Toronto's official um, bee. And that's because it's so colorful. It's a bicolored striped sweat bee. And so they're all different colors and they all do different things. Um, they're really exciting to learn about. So I won't talk too much more about the different kinds, but I will talk more about one particular group of bees because they're kind of the main characters of my research, if you will. Um, these are the leaf cutting bees, the Latin name is Mediculidae. And they're called leaf cutter bees because for some species in the group, the females will actually cut pieces of leaf and use them to line their nests. So you can see her, she's holding that leaf, flying it into her nest, and she's using it to line her, her nest. So she lays eggs on top of balls of pollen and nectar, and then they're like sheathed in, in these leaves. And maybe you've seen this in your garden before, these, it looks like someone went around with a hole puncher and punched a bunch of holes in the leaves. That's the leaf cutter be um, cutting holes. So these are the main, um, the main characters of the work that I, I do. And one of the reasons why I focus on this group is because a lot of species in this group nest in pre-existing cavities. So maybe 
some beetle larvae came along and they were boring holes into the stump. And a woodpecker pecked at it and left a bunch of holes. Well, a cavity nesting bee might be very happy to use that as your nesting site. Now, luckily for us, these cavity nesting bees are also happy to nest in artificial wooden structures that we can put out for them. And that makes observing their nests a lot easier because we know where we put the boxes, so we know where to find the bees. And that's in comparison to trying to study ground nesting bees. It's really hard to find little holes in the ground compared to these structures that we can put up. And so the work I'm gonna be telling you about is mainly focused on this group of bees, these leaf cutting bees. Um, but again, hopefully you'll feel excited to go explore all the other kinds of different bees that we have around us. So that was a very quick intro as to who some of the bees are. I wanted to move on to the next part of our little road trip, looking at what rising temperatures might mean for insects in general. And I want to bring you back to this very simple concept, and maybe you learned about it in elementary school, but could use a refresher, this idea of cold-blooded versus warm-blooded animals. And it basically has to do with an animal's physiology of how they um, control the temperature in their body. And so if you're a cold-blooded animal, like this green bee, your body temperature is going to depend on the temperature of the environment. So if it's cold outside, very simply, your temperature is going to be colder. If it's warm, your body temperature is going to be warm. Now, they can regulate their temperature by changing their environment. So let's say it's a very warm day and they want to hide. They can go and hide in the shade, but their bodies can't control that themselves. If you're a warm-blooded animal like this human here, it's the opposite. So your body temperature doesn't depend on the environment. So even if it was really cold outside, your body temperature would still stay, stay around the same temperature. Right, so put very crudely, we do an experiment, we put these animals in a very cold place, the bee's body temperature would drop, the human's body temperature would stay relatively constant. And similarly, if you put them in a very hot environment, the bees body temperature would rise and our body temperatures would stay relatively constant. Now, in the context of climate changes, temperatures are warming up. We might imagine things to be worse for cold-blooded animals because of how sensitive they are to temperature. And of course, we should be totally aware that, of course, there are limits to how much even we can control our temperatures. Um, I'm thinking of what happened in Lytton, BC. Um, so there are limits. But if you're thinking about it very ge generally, a cold-blooded animal is going to have a harder time adapting to such crazy temperature change because they can they can only regulate their temperatures so much. And actually, scientists have tested, have already tested the effects of different temperatures on lots of different insects, mostly in lab settings. And of course, how an insect is going to respond is going to depend on what insect you're talking about and also where they are. But in general, there are a number of responses that lots of insects show that are very widespread, even if they're different insects. And so for example, temperature can change how active insects are. Specifically, some insects are more active when it's really warm out. They might call more, they might crawl or walk or fly more. Um, temperature can change an insect's survival and longevity, and specifically very warm temperatures can actually cause insects to age faster. And it can also change their growth rate. So a lot of insects, they might, if it's very hot out, they might go from being a baby to an adult at a faster rate, so they mature faster. Now at the same time with that effect, a lot of studies have also shown that despite growing up faster, these insects end up growing up to a smaller size. So they grow fast, but end up small compared to those ones that grow up in cooler conditions. And now I should mention that these studies weren't necessarily carried out with the idea of, of climate change in mind. A lot of them are actually done because scientists are, are thinking about contexts of agriculture and forestry. So maybe they're trying to see how temperature will affect a pest insect, or maybe they're trying to rear a beneficial insect and they want to know the best conditions to rear it. But a lot of this can be applied to the effects of climate change on insects. We can take the information we know from these studies 
and see if it can inform our understanding of how climate change might affect insects. Now, the one important thing is that most of these studies that I'm talking about are done in lab environments. So scientists will take these insects, either adults or juveniles, put them in incubators, change the temperatures, and then record the response of these insects. And that can be a very useful tool, but of course, real life is very different. Insects are interacting with all kinds of other organisms, plants, other animals, other insects. And on top of that, temperature conditions aren't constant outdoors the way they are in the lab. Maybe an insect that's in a very hot area can go hide in the shade, or if it's very cold, they can go and, and sit in the sun for a bit. So the lab is very different. And so that's kind of where my work comes in. I try to do these experiments, but instead of studying the response of insects in the lab, I try to take the lab outside and study these insects in their natural environment with the context of climate change in mind. And so I've been at this for five years now, and I think I'm just starting to learn something. And so hopefully I can, I can share some of that with you tonight. Okay, so we talked about who the bees are. We talked very generally about how temperature could affect um, what our insects are doing, at least in lab settings. So I wanted to move on to talk a bit about how we might approach doing work looking at the effects of climate change on insects. And so maybe some of you are familiar with graphs like this from the media. This is taken from the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Essentially, every few years, a whole bunch of people from different countries come together and make a big report about um, where the Earth is in terms of climate change. So things like how much temperature rise have we seen, how much sea level rise, ocean acidification, not exactly hopeful things. Um, but what this graph is showing is how much temperature change the Earth has experienced relative to some baseline period, which is from 1850 to 1900. And so you can see the temperatures are starting to creep up, and then by 1960, the increase really accelerates. Um, and so now we're at almost two degrees warmer than it was in the pre-industrial period. And it might not seem like a lot, but if you think about that we're averaging over this in, over the entire globe, that's a really frightening amount. Now, just to situate myself a little bit here, I was born well, just before 2000, but unfortunately I didn't start studying bees right when I was born. I didn't start grad school until 2018. Um, and so that's just to say that the amount of time that I'm capturing as students working on this is very small relative to the whole history of how the, how the climate has been changing. And even if we consider, um, I'm gonna talk more about this later, but my supervisor, Dr. Forrest, has a long-term study that started in 2013. And that seems like a long time ago for me, but even that um, compared to the entire history of climate change is not covering a huge part of, of how much temperature has changed. And so, the question is, well, how do we study climate change impacts on these populations if we're only looking at a little window of time? Right? Ideally, I would have started studying bees in the pre-industrial era, era, and I would have kept going all the way until now, and then I can compare bee populations now to the way they were before. Now, I can't time travel, um, but mountains is one of the ways you can get around this. I'm sure those of you perhaps who have been to mountains can attest that at lower elevations, conditions are much warmer than at higher elevations. And that's definitely true at some of our sites in Colorado. The warmer sites at low elevations can be even two degrees or more warmer than the higher elevation sites. And so instead of going back in time, it means that I can spend the summer hiking up and down the mountain um, within a day, going to sites that are warmer and sites that are cooler. And so you can think of this a bit as if, as though we're using those cooler high elevation sites to represent what things were like earlier when in the pre-industrial period, we can use these lower elevation sites to represent what things are like more like now. 
And this is actually a very um, common technique used by biologists. We call it a space for time substitution. Um, essentially, we're taking the differences in temperature in a very small space, and we're using that as a replacement for going back in time. And of course, it's not perfect. Other things have changed over the past few hundred years um, other than temperature, but it does give us at least um, an idea of how temperature can affect these insects. Okay, so that kind of sets the scene for some of the work we've been doing. And so I'm going to talk about how we apply this um, in the Rocky Mountains, Colorado. So in the summers around um, late May or June, we go for a bit of a road trip. We drive down to Colorado, go to the old station that's about five hours from Denver. And I stayed at this field station called the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. It's about 2,900 meters above sea level. And I really like living here. I get to share my living space with other researchers, but also other friends, furry friends that I make. It's a good place to spend the summer. And so in 2013, my supervisor, Dr. Forrest, set up a bunch of sites in and around this research station. And she and her research state students have been monitoring these sites, tracking with bees since then, except for 2020. And the sites are all kind of different. So some of them are lower down in elevation and they're a little bit warmer. And some of them are higher up in elevation and they're quite a bit cooler. So it's about a 700 meter elevational difference. And at each of these sites, we have these wooden boxes, we call them trap nests, but you may have heard of them being called as bee hotels. It's essentially a wooden box that um, the, the cavity nesting bees are happy to nest in. Here's just um, a marmot for scale. They're around the size of our groundhog, but that way you can tell how big it is. And the, the cavity nesting bees are quite happy to nest in them. So here are a couple Hopefully the other videos will play, but these are a couple of moms actually being busy at work. That's a leaf cutter bee. Um, so they're very happy to nest in these boxes. We get a lot of bees nesting in them. Now the holes are lined with semi-transparent paper straws, and this isn't necessary from the bees' point of view, but for us what it means is that every few days we can go in, temporarily pull out the straws, and if we hold them to the light, can actually count how many cells each bee has created. And so this is my cartoon version of what's going on inside. So each of those cells has a ball of pollen and nectar um, that the bee has collected, an egg that she lays on top of it, and then she builds these little walls, either out of mud or pebbles or, or chewed up pieces of leaf, different materials depending on what species. This is just a picture of what you would see if I cut a little window open in that straw, which I do do. Um, it, um, it gives you an idea of how tiny that little bee egg is. It's about the size of a grain of rice. Um, and so basically what, what this information can give us is we can count the number of eggs in every single straw and determine how many eggs each mom produces. And by recording the dates that we're checking these Nests, we can determine how long it takes for uh, a mother bee to build their nest. I should also mention that what we also do is we catch the bees temporarily at their nest and we put a little dot of paint on their backs. And that way, if she uses more than one bowl, then I know that um, I know I can add all her babies together so I know how many eggs each mom is having in total. So most moms have somewhere between 10 and 20 eggs, but I do have to point out this one bee that we had in 2019 who was quite exceptional. So exceptional that I had to name her. I didn't really name all the bees, but I named her after Jane Goodall because she had 60 eggs and she was just a very special bee to have around. So another thing that Dr. Forrest has been collecting is temperature data. So every site has one of these little temperature loggers there that's capturing air temperature every hour. And so what that gives us putting it all together is now we have 10 years of data from six different sites that are all different parts of the mountain. And um, it covers quite a, quite a large time span. 
And we have data um, that, that, that captures the number of eggs produced by marked females. We also have temperature data. And so that sets us up to ask some questions about how different temperatures might be affecting bee populations. Okay, so what did we find? I'm gonna start by showing you some results we have looking at how temperature affects nesting rate. So that's how fast mother bees are producing these cells. And this is essentially us trying to understand how temperature affects bee activity. Remember earlier I talked about how higher temperatures can make some insects more active. And so that's kind of what we're getting at here. And what our data showed was that the warmer it was, the faster the mother bees build their nests. So you might see that there's a lot of lines here. And the reason is that we are actually looking at multiple species in the block. So each different color represents a different species. But you can see they're kind of doing similar things. The warmer it is, the more number, the, the more cells they make per day. And that's actually not too surprising. It's actually very cool. The weather is very cool, this, even in the summers where we are. Um, the daily temperatures can go up to mid-20s, but the night temperatures are quite cool, between two to five degrees. And sometimes the snow doesn't melt until very late. So this past summer, when I was there in June, there was still a bunch of snow there. And we know that mother bees need at least some warmth to be able to fly properly. It's hard to move the wings when it's very cold out. And I can attest to this anecdotally because sometimes if I go to the field too early, all the mother bees are just hanging out in the front of their nests, not coming out. Sometimes I'm waiting there, shivering, hoping they'll come out so that I can catch them and put a dot of paint on their backs. But luckily this bee, you can see she's got a little orange dot on her back already. So it probably wasn't. <clears throat> But yes, they do like to fly better when it's warm. Okay, so maybe warmer weather is good if they're able to go faster. Well, we're curious to know a little bit more about how temperatures are affecting these bees. So something else we looked at was how the lifespan of mother bees was changing with temperature. Because if you remember back to what I was talking about, what researchers had shown in the lab was that temperature can affect insect longevity and survival, specifically um, a lot of insects age faster when it's really warm out. And so we don't have a good way of knowing how old a bee is um, exactly in our study system, but we could get a sense, a general sense of how old they might be by counting the total number of days we're seeing female bees nesting for, because presumably most of their life is spent doing doing that activity. So how does bee lifespan change with temperature? Um, well, what we find is that for all the bee species we looked at, um, temperatures, the warmer it was, the shorter their lifespan. So again, this is showing for five different species. That's what all the different colors are. But each dot on that graph is a single mother bee that we were following. And there are 445 mother bees on this graph. And so you can see on the hot end of things, um, when temperatures and mother bee experienced were very hot, they lived for a shorter period of time. And when temperatures were very cool, they lived for a longer amount of time. So warmer um, conditions resulted in shorter lifespan. And again, based on what scientists have shown in the lab, maybe this isn't super surprising in a, in a very sad way. Um, but this finding, I should mention, is not just in insects. It's actually in a lot of other animals, in fish and amphibians, reptiles. Um, temperature does affect how long animals survive for. And I can't help noticing that the similarities between all these, in, all these animals, well, they all happen to be cold-blooded animals that might be extra sensitive to changes in temperature. Okay, so what have we found so far? We found that when temperatures are warmer, mother bees build these cells more quickly, they nest at a faster rate. But despite going on for faster, they have a shorter lifespan. They can't go on for as long. Okay, so how does this all affect the number of eggs a mother bee can produce? And so what we looked at next, was how egg production changes with lifespan. So is the number of eggs a female bee produces, is that related to how long she lives for? 
And yes, it absolutely is. So bees who live for longer have more eggs compared to bees who live for shorter, they have fewer eggs. So this is similar, again, each data point on this graph represents a single mother bee that we were following. It represents how long she lived for, and then how many eggs she produced. Okay, so putting together everything we found with warmer temperatures, mother bees are going faster. They're producing cells at a faster rate. We think that has to do with um, the fact that it's so cold up there that when it's warm, they want to go um, start nesting. Despite going faster, they have shorter lifespans, and bees with shorter lifespans produce fewer eggs. And so based on what we're seeing from our data, it seems that rising temperatures in these mountain habitats might have detrimental impacts on bee populations, at least for the species that we're studying. And I would say that's kind of sad to know. Um, something I think about a lot and I think about these mother bees and what, what this all means for them. And I've mostly been talking about things getting warmer, um, but we do have some information about what it means as precipitation patterns change when things get drier. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about this very briefly because it's kind of more like the side story here. Um, the idea is that we think that as things get drier, maybe there'll be fewer flowers available for these bees. And so maybe that could have a negative effect on them. Now, at the same time, bees need warm and sunny weather to fly in. If it's rainy and cold all the time, they're not going to go out and forage. And so maybe there's this kind of trade-off going on where on the one hand, more rain maybe needs more flowers. But on the other hand, having fewer rain days means that these mother bees can go out and, and get the flowers more often. And so just very quickly, what did we find? How does, what is the relationship between precipitation and the number of eggs these bees are producing? Well, it's kind of a mixed game here. It's like rainbow dots everywhere. Mostly you can see that for a few of the species. So again, each color is a different species. You see the pattern going up. So the more precipitation, the more eggs they're producing. Um, but you see the dark blue species is going down. So it looks like, the more precipitation or the less precipitation, more eggs, and the, the, the more precipitation, the less eggs. So a very mixed bag of stories here. Um, and ultimately I can't even tell you which of the two things, the flowers or the more time to forage is going on. Um, but overall, it looks like for most of the species, drier isn't very good. Okay, so I've talked about some of the work we've been doing in Colorado. So I wanted to move on to some of the work I'm currently doing in cities. And I should mention a couple of things uh, right off the bat. First, that this is in collaboration with Dr. Alana Nayakaitis Lewis, and she's a research scientist at Environment Climate Change Canada. And secondly, this is really work in progress. So I don't have as much of a, a nice story or a sad story, but a, a package story as the, uh, the work in Colorado. Um, but I will tell you the general idea behind the project I'm doing with this um, and also some of the very early results. And then finally, this is kind of my COVID project because in 2020 in the summer, this is where I plan to be. I'd, I'd already spent 2019 in Colorado and 2020 was supposed to be a summer where I would start a bunch of new experiments. But of course we know what 2020 was, so that didn't happen and I stayed home. And I hung out with the local bees and wasps. And I should say that the diversity of species we get here is actually very impressive given that most of the time we don't associate high biodiversity with cities. And so I was thinking, I thought, well, there must be some way I can do similar work that I do in the Rockies and do it in the city. And I was thinking about the way I have different sites along the mountain, some that are warmer and some that are colder, and that I can move between them within the course of a day. And I was thinking, well, the city is actually not just boring concrete. It's actually a very patchy place. And what I mean by this is, at least in Toronto, we have the lakeshore, we have lots of parks, we have lots of people's gardens, and these are all places that are 
embedded within the more built up concrete places. And so this kind of patchwork of land use actually trans translates into a patchwork of temperature. And so we have cooler conditions up there in the east, like in Rouge Park, the temperatures are cooler. And then it's really hot in some more built up places like downtown or, or Rexdale. And so we have all kinds of temperature conditions and that's very similar to my, to my mountain habitat. And so instead of hiking around on the mountain, I can move around the city um, quite easily, go to all these different sites and they have different temperatures. All right, so if we remember back to our um, little graph of climate with the temperature rise, we were using the cooler sites as if they were the pre-industrial area and the warmer sites representing warmer periods. Well, now we can use maybe a site up in Bridge Park as our pre-industrial reference area and a site up in Rexdale as the more current temperatures. And so that's pretty much what this project is about. In 2020, um, about 37 really wonderful people from both Ottawa and in Toronto volunteered to be a part of my project, um, volunteered their gardens to be a much part of my project. Um, and I chose the sites such that they would represent a variety of different temperature conditions, just like how we have sites along the mountain that have different temperature conditions. And so just like our mountain sites, I put up a number of these trap nests inside the gardens um, and hope that cavity nesting bees will occupy them. And each box actually has a temperature sensor embedded inside of it so I can track the temperature inside the nest. This is just a box in somebody else's garden. Now, one thing I, when I designed this project in 2020, I kind of realized that Despite the fact that I can move around the city relatively easy, um, monitoring 37 sites across two cities might be more work that I can, I can handle. And on top of that, even though I couldn't be in Colorado for 2020, I knew that the coming summers, I would probably want to be there if the border restrictions were lifted. And so that's all to say that I knew I needed some help monitoring these boxes. Well, I was super lucky because not only did the gardeners who volunteered to be a part of their pro my project allow me to put a bunch of research equipment in, at their houses, they also agreed to monitor the boxes for me. So I really owe them my thanks. I think a lot of them are on Zoom tonight um, because this project wouldn't work without them. And I think it's really special to have gotten to know these people and to share, um, share interests and pollinators with them. So I tried to design the trap nests to facilitate um, uh, I tried to design the trap nest to facilitate this and make it easier for people to make observations. So the side panels, the video is not working, but the doors can actually be removed and you can see a cross-sectional view of the nest through a plastic panel. Um, and so in that picture, on that side, you can see those yellow balls of pollen and nectar that the bee has collected, and she's um, chewed up bits of leaves to make the walls. And so that's at Rob Longair's place in Ottawa. And it's been really cool to watch these insects develop because I have this cross-sectional view, um, even though I might be experiencing it vicariously, because oftentimes, like this summer, I'll be in Colorado, and people will be sending me photos. So this is a mason bee nest. You can see it starts out as some pollen and some eggs the first week. And actually that's the female bee up there. She's probably working on, on the last cell. <coughs> By week two, you can see that the eggs have hatched into little baby worms and they're eating out their pollen. By week four, you can see that the ones further back have finished their pollen. And there are these nice fat larvae. The ones on the outside are still working on eating. And then by week six, they've all spun cocoons and they'll stay as cocoons until, the, until spring when they emerge as adults. That's a mason bee nest. This is a leaf cutter bee nest. And so you can see all those fresh green leaves she's put in there um, to line her nest. And this is actually a potter wasp nest. And I've been neglecting the wasps for the whole talk, which I feel very bad about. Um, but wasps are very frequent occupants of these boxes, and they're gentle, solitary wasps that don't want to bother anybody. 
But what they do is they catch caterpillars and they sting them with their stinger to paralyze them, not to kill them, just to paralyze them so they stay fresh for their babies to eat. But paralyzing them makes sure that the caterpillar doesn't thrash around while they're trying to move them from one place to the next. So it's been very interesting to, to look at these bees. Um, you'll notice that there are these paper um, grid marks along the sides. And so what that does is when someone sends me a photo of what they've seen in their garden, when I'm away, I can tell how much the nest has progressed. Okay, so with this project, I'm still interested in the relationships between temperature and bees. And I'm focusing on something slightly different. If you recall back um, to earlier in the talk, I was talking about the general effects of high temperatures, and that one of the things that researchers have shown is that um, when temperatures are very high, it speeds up the rate of development from baby insect to adult insect in certain insects. Now that's one of the effects, um, and, and then when it's cooler, they tend to develop more slowly. But along with that, they've also shown that developing faster is not necessarily a good thing. Um, adults end up smaller as, as smaller adults compared to adults later on that develop in cooler conditions. And at least in the insect world in general, being smaller can mean that you don't survive for as long. It can also mean that you produce fewer offspring. So this can have um, big implications for the success of the population. And so I was more interested in this piece of the story um, for this project. Now you can imagine it might be a little tricky to measure mass of adult insects because they're gonna wanna fly around. Well, measuring baby insects is a lot easier because by the end of the summer, they're at this stage of life where um, they're in what we call diapause. And so they've, their metabolic rate has dropped and they're pretty much asleep and they'll stay that way until the spring. And so what I do at the end of the summer is I bring all those trap nests into the lab, um, I take all the baby bees out, and then I weigh each one on a scale. It's very sensitive. And so this is um, what, well, maybe the video is not. It's okay. Um, what, what it would show is how um, you can take plastic panels off of these boxes, and then I can pretty much just scoop the bees out one by one and put them very gently on these uh, balance, micro balances. Um, these are just a couple of photos of what the process looks like. So these are mason bee cocoons after I've taken them out. See how tiny they are with the ruler up there. These are leaf cutter bee cocoons. The cocoons are actually inside, but they're still wrapped up in their leaves, which by the end of the summer, they aren't fresh and green anymore. They're kind of more dried out. And these are potter wasp larvae. Um, and the cocoon is very thin. And so when I was weighing them, I had to remove them from their cocoons. Okay, so now I have a bunch of temperature data from inside the nests. And I have the, the, the mass of over a thousand baby bees and wasps. And so is nest temperature associated with baby bee and wasp mass? So similar to our Colorado study, um, there are lots of different species that nest in these boxes. So I'm gonna show you the, the results um, separated by species. And so I'll start with the mason bees, which is what we have the most of. Well, what we find is almost the opposite of what we expected. The warmer the nest temperature they experienced, the heavier they were. Um, but the effect isn't very strong. You can see it doesn't really increase by a lot, and the data points are all kind of like scattered everywhere. So I would say, yes, there might be a little bit of increase when it's warmer, but it's really hard to tell. There isn't a clear pattern. The leaf cutter bees seem to do something different. When it's warmer, their body, body mass seems to go down. So warmer temperatures, lighter cocoons. For the wasps, the potter wasps, we don't have as much data for them, but something similar to the leaf cutter bees. It looks like as it gets warmer, they're having lower body mass. For grass carrying wasps, which are a very interesting group of insects, um, they seem to do the opposite. So the warmer it is, heavier their body mass. So again, this is very, very early data. Um, I'm still working through a lot of things, but it looks like just squinting at these that it's hard to know what exactly is going on. Um, 
the data points are everywhere. There, there isn't really a strong pattern. And obviously, the effect of temperature on the mass of these insects depends on the insect that you're talking about. So I would say I don't really have an answer for this question yet. And hopefully, I'll have a better sense and be able to give you a better answer soon. Um, I'm still processing the data from all the boxes from this past summer. So um, in fact, I was at a site this morning. And so I think I will know better, hopefully, by, by the end of this year. OK, so that was the last stop for this evening. I feel like I've done a lot of talking, and I would love to hear from other people other than myself. Um, but before I end, I wanted to wrap things up by saying that, um, for me at least, sometimes thinking about all of this, how changes in climate will impact these bees, these critters that I've come to love so much, it's kind of a, a disheartening to, thing to think about all the time. Um, and maybe some of you feel similarly. It's just really hard to know how one makes a difference. Well, for me, where I find a lot of hope is first in learning about all these different critters, what their names are, what they do, and secondly, in helping other people appreciate how wonderful they are. And I don't know if there are rules about what one can say as a scientist trained in the Western scientific approach, but just as a, as a citizen of the earth, I think maybe what we really need to do is just to love these insects more. Yes, maybe science can help us establish the rate and the scale of decline. Maybe it can help us explain why certain species are declining. But I think unless we really love these insects, no one's going to do anything with that science. And for me, at least, I think loving the insects simply starts with going out and staring at a patch of flowers and wondering who's on that flower and what they're doing and what their life is like, whether I'm in the city or in the mountains. And so hopefully um, you'll feel encouraged to do that too. Before I end, I want to acknowledge that um, there have been people on the lands that I've been working on. Um, these nations have been here in, for many years. Um, and so in Colorado, the slopes and meadows and forests that I work on are the ancestral lands of the Tabagashi Band of the Ute people. In Toronto, the gardens, parks, and green spaces I study, bees and wasps are in, are situated on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas, the New Credit, and the Anishinaabe, the Chippewas, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. And in Ottawa, my research sites are situated on the unceded traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people. So hopefully, I know many of us are already learning, and hopefully we can continue to learn about these people as well. I have many people to thank because none of these projects would have been possible without them, including the critters that I love so much and also the community scientists that I listed earlier. And I want to thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to do my best to answer questions or hear your comments or ideas or, or stories. Have you noticed a, a difference in the number of bees, the bee populations between in the cities and, and in Colorado, for instance? Okay, so for, I don't know if Zoom people can hear, but the question is, have I noticed differences in the number of bees in cities versus Colorado? It's hard to say because um, there's such different places. So I would have to compare a naturalized area in in or near Toronto versus Colorado, because Colorado, um, where I am, there's like nobody there. It's very different. There are no honeybees, and honeybees are known to be um, a big competitor. Um, and also, the climate is extremely different. It's very cold and extreme up there, the temperatures. Um, so, I'm not sure I've noticed different numbers. I haven't done the same research in both to be able to compare properly. Um, yeah, I think it's it's a hard comparison to make. I would say that there are definitely, definitely more species, I think, um, probably in the area that we're in, I would say, compared to the city. The city, there's probably certain species that are very, very common, a lot of very rare species, just because certain species do really well in the city. Um, whereas in Colorado, maybe it's more um, it's for even in terms of the different kinds of species, but it's hard to tell because I haven't done the same study in the two different places. 
Do you think the long term, um, like going forward, would you expect that the bees would sort of acclimatize or mutate maybe to be able to survive in a warmer climate? Or do you expect that they will die off? Yeah, that's a really good question. So essentially, will the bees be able to adapt yeah. to climate change? Yeah. yeah, I think it's a, a big thing that um, lots of people are wondering about lots of animals. And it's actually, um, it's actually one thing that what part of my PhD is looking at that I didn't talk about tonight is whether as it gets warmer, are these populations gonna be able to move up the mountain where it's cooler? Um, and, or will they need to? Or will they need to, yeah. I think, I think it depends because different species seem to tolerate things differently, that's for sure. But I think if they're having very like poor reproductive success at low elevations, based on what we found, maybe they will need to move up. Um, the, the issue becomes, are they able to fly up there? Like, are they able to, to fly that distance to get somewhere else? So are they able to get to these other sites? And then once they're at those sites, are there the habitat requirements that they need? So are there their favorite flowers up there um, for the cavity nesting insects? Is there wood up there for them to nest in? Are there other predators that might eat them? Um, and so I think, I think, yeah, it's it's a question that people want to be able to answer. And with animals, it's hard because the best test would be to take the animal and put it up there and see if it's able to um, how well it responds. But we don't want to do that for ethical purposes right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but people do do it with plants. So I think the whole, yeah, it's a big can of worms. Will they adapt or will, will they just go extinct at lower elevations or where they are? Um, yeah. I think I've noticed this year that the bumblebees are smaller. I, I haven't seen a, a, a good, you know, healthy looking bumblebee. Not that they're not healthy, but they're, they're I'm sure they're smaller than they used to be. Yeah, it's, there are definitely studies that show that. Um, I don't know, I don't think studies for here specifically, but definitely studies that show declining body size in bumblebees. Um, I think along along elevation gradients, it's hard to tell because I would say that like our own observations, at least like my own in the city, are very biased towards whatever we see in our garden. So maybe one year it just so happens that the colony that you're seeing, these bumblebees do live in colonies. Um, maybe it just so happens that that colony has smaller workers, uh, or that you didn't spot the the queen coming out. So it's very random in a city. Like the best thing we can do is have a citywide research project and measure the you know the sizes of all the little bees. But it's very possible that that they are smaller. And it, it's not just a temperature effect. It could be maybe they couldn't find enough food, or maybe they interacted with pesticides. So it's hard to know, but it's very possible it's a temperature effect too. Yeah. And the difference between shade and sun. <laughs> My garden's very shady, yeah. and I don't notice as, as many bees as as I do sunny garden that I had also. Um, um, so they seem to come out more in the sun, eh? Hey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, now I'm I'm just not sure though whether you know there aren't as many blooms in the, in the shade. Right, it's true. And, it's a and whether they they do come out on on the blooms in the shade. Yeah. When they're when they are in bloom, you know. Yeah. I mean, there definitely are bees when there are many blooms in the shade garden. Yeah. But I'm not sure if there are as many. I, you see them more predominantly in the sun. In the sun. Yeah, I think it it definitely depends on the kind of bee too, because bumblebees are quite good at tolerating cooler temperatures. Um, yeah, they're the main. They're the bees that you'll see in the Arctic and at the higher parts of. Of the mountains, and so they're probably also the main bees you're seeing in the shady parts of your garden, I imagine. Um, the smaller bees, yeah, they do need warmer temperatures to be able to fly properly. Um, and so maybe, yeah, maybe you see more small bees flying around in the sun, I'm not sure. Um, I saw that as well, because I have a couple of bushes, 
that attract, I don't know if they're bees or wasps, but yeah, one of them. And earlier in the summer when it was raining a lot, I didn't notice any. I thought, oh, they all left. And then when it started to get sunny and hot, then they were all there. Yeah. There was lots and lots of them. So to your point, whether it's shady, I mean, even I think rain and just, you know, lack of sun or heat or something is does influence them. Yeah, I would say noticeably. Yeah, the weather does really change how active they are. Um, but I think that's not to say that like having a shady garden isn't as good for bees. Like I think the more different kinds of habitats you are probably the better for all kinds of organisms. Um, and different bee species will have very different thresholds. So some bees can tolerate high condition, high temperatures a lot better than other bees. Um, and so having yeah, different kinds of places. I mean, at least I think with the study I've been doing in the urban study, actually there are a lot of uh, wasp species, the grass carrying wasp. Um, and these are, these are good wasps, they're friendly wasps. They seem to really like shady environments. I don't know if that answers your question or that that was just more like a story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so um, there's a question online. <laughs> Do solitary bees have long enough lives to adapt to changes in temperature? Okay, yeah, that was similar to your question um, about adaptation. I think I think there's one thing like so. I guess as ecologists, we talk about adaptation, and that would be a whole population kind of be changing and having different maybe different traits or different um, characteristics about them that make them maybe better able to tolerate changes. Um, whether a single bee can change, we call that plasticity, so whether they themselves can change, not the whole population, um, that's hard to know. Um, I think we need to track an individual bee to really know, um, and we actually don't know much about how solitary bees, um, how, what their cognition is like. We know a lot about honeybees and bumblebees, and they can actually, they're very good at learning things, learning new things. You might have heard in the media about these bumblebees who are like learning how to play or they can count. So they definitely are able to learn things. Whether that can translate into helping them tolerate different temperature conditions, it's harder to know. Yeah. So there's that piece, like can they learn something and maybe that can help them. There's also the microhabitat piece. So maybe let's say I lived in downtown Toronto, it's really hot there. There's a lot of concrete. Um, but even then, let's say there's a really small garden in that concrete jungle. Well, can the bees use that small microhabitat? And it's cooler there, even though on average the whole area is hot. And so there's two ways. Maybe they can, I don't know, learn something and you know innovate, or they can find little pockets of microhabitats that they can find better temperature conditions at. Thank you. Questions? What got you interested in bees and wasps? Oh, what got me interested in bees and wasps? I would say I was interested in insects. Um, in general, I used to study aphids, not as charismatic. <laughs> um, I guess I got the chance in my third year of undergrad, I got the chance to go um, out to Colorado as part of an undergrad program. And I got assigned to, um, to my current supervisor um, who studies bees. And I love the bees and I also really liked working with her. <laughs> so I guess, I guess I chose the supervisor. Um, but also, yeah, it's it's really special to work with bees. I think part of it is seeing these really hardworking moms and how much how much they care. And well, I can't say how much they care, but <laughs> just watching the way they work is really special to me. Um, just watching them fly back and forth, and they you know they know exactly where their nest is. They're working all day. I think I think that's really special to me. Mm -hmm. They do have a certain intelligence, like. The one that you were calling the uh, the klepto mom or whatever it was okay. that stole, like just sort of took over yeah. the nest that the other 
mom worked so hard I mean yeah. what does the other mom do like beat her or something or like do well, they have do they fight or does she just surrender her, her nest yeah sometimes so sometimes they don't know sometimes those they're so sneaky they just go in and out and the hardworking mom never finds out um, but sometimes I think they do detect that their nest has been parasitized and oftentimes I'll see so it's a long a long tube like in those boxes and they have lots of space to put at least 20 cells in there and sometimes I'll see when the last cell has a parasite egg in it, they'll seal it off early. So they don't, they know that a parasite has found the location of this nest already. So they don't want to invest more into that cell, into that nest if they know it, it's, you know, known already. So they, yeah, they do, they do some, have some kind of sense of maybe they can smell them or saw them. Yeah, I think there's all kinds of things going on in their minds that I don't know about and I want to know more, but it also keeps me very humble as a scientist, I think. Oh, Dorcas says, do we know how bees recognize their nest entrance if the lawn is mowed or plants grow? That's, yeah, that's an interesting question because, so yeah, talking about their cognition, they do really look for visual signals around. It's funny, sometimes I'll be sitting in front of a, of a trap nest and that will confuse them because they're like, what is this extra object here? Um, and where's my nest? So they are very visually oriented in terms of finding their nests. I feel like if the lawn is mowed, that's such like a dramatic change that it might be quite difficult for them to find their nest. Um, I imagine they probably still might be able to just by knowing how far they flew. It might take them a while, but it's hard to know. Plants grow, I think, I think they should still be able to find it because plants are probably growing quite slowly and they can probably still locate their nests. Yeah, it's hard to know how like the changes we make to our gardens as gardeners will affect um, how well they find their nests. But I imagine that it depends on how dramatic the change is. If suddenly the entire garden is raised and turned over, then it's probably all their landmarks for finding their sites are gone. But if it's something more gradual like plants growing, I think they could still find their nests. Yeah. My granddaughter was stung by a yellow jacket okay. this summer. And the nest seemed to be down in the grass. I didn't think that they would nest in grass. Okay. Is that is that true? Or were did yeah. be happen to just be down on the grass? I think they're different. I know the, so the German yellow jacket, I think like the ones that are all over the place right now and patios, they, I think they make their own nests in those gray paper, um, paper nests. Um, there are species though that nest in the ground and species that nest in other structures. Um, so it could, yeah, it's possible it could have been. Yeah, I was just surprised <laughs> it would, you know, there'd be a, a nest in the grass. Which yeah. is pretty dense, you know. Okay. I had a, I mean, my own story is that I was moving hay at my sister's farm and there was a nest inside um, the hay bale. So we were, yeah, covered in them, but they were nesting inside the hay bale. Um, and I was, I think I was running too fast to have looked at them carefully, and decided <laughs> what kind of wasp they were. At that point. <laughs> but maybe they weren't, yeah, the German yellow jacket. Sure. You mentioned there's like four different, 4,000 different varieties, like mm -hmm. that's globally, I assume. No, that's just North America. Just North America? Globally, there's 20,000. Oh, yeah. okay. And 10,000, 10, uh, 100,000 wasp species. So there are way more wasps than there are. And so North America, so do you know just like in Canada? I mean, because we're yeah. probably further north. In Canada, there's about 800 species. And then in Toronto, three I think 364 by the last survey, but almost half. Yeah, some some species are definitely very rare. I think that 364 includes the rusty patched bumblebee, which you may have heard of, but it's now endangered and hasn't been seen. I haven't even seen it myself here before. Um, so, but there are 300 species is a lot of species mm -hmm. think, for a city at least. I'm sure Vaughn is similar. And we don't know 
diversity numbers for wasps because nobody studies them. <laughs> but hopefully we get people studying them. Okay, are there any other questions, comments? I, I'm, I'm just surprised that, uh, you know, a, a city like Toronto could have a, 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 a what would you say, a normal um, population of these. These must, because, um, of course, we do have a river valley that's that's quite, that connects quite a long landscape. Yeah. So maybe that's that's part of it. But I didn't think they would uh, survive so well with patches of, of habitat. Yeah. Um, but, you know, maybe it's, they're different from mammals, I, I guess, that don't thrive when there are separated patches yes. of, of habitat, eh? Yeah. But maybe the bees don't travel as, as far. So if they find a nice garden, they, they, they stay within a certain distance. Is that I do the think case? that's the case. I, don't, I can't say for like others, uh, like every species, but definitely with the cavity nesting bees that I've been studying um, in Colorado, admittedly, I do notice that the females, I see them, the females that I mark on flowers away from the nest, but they never go further than five to 10 meters away from the nest if there are flowers there. So they really, if they find a good spot, they really just stay there. Um, even the few times in, in my own garden in Toronto where I'll find a ground nesting bee nesting in the ground and I'll watch her, she just goes to the flowers that are a couple meters away. She doesn't seem to be far. Um, of course, we can't say for all the bees because I think especially bumblebees, they probably need more flower resources than maybe what's just around them. But I do think they, they are very localized. And actually, just as a general um, biodiversity thing, there's new, newer or more recent research to show that even though patches are very fragmented, so there's like, you know, a, a garden here and then no more gardens and then a garden here, those patches can still have very high biodiversity even if they're the only one there, as long as there are lots of patches. Okay, so if there aren't any um, more comments, questions, I just want to thank you dear, for coming. It was very, very informative and uh, I must say that I like the interaction, and I think it's very important that we can actually see, you know, the effect of bees on our gardens, you know. So um, thank you very much, and um, hope to hear you talk another time yeah. when you've done additional research. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.